Welcome to the Journey to Happy podcast, a podcast dedicated to share inspiring stories, motivational tips to help you tune into your own superpowers, get out of your own way, and show up in your life as your own superhero. Because let's face it, happiness is homemade. I am Olga, your host. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Journey to Happy podcast. Today I'm going to be sharing with you a very personal story close to my heart. It is my grief story and I'm going to walk you through six of the steps that I walk myself through and steps that I walk many of my clients who have experienced loss, specifically the loss of a child or a pregnancy or a baby. And my hope with this podcast is that you get some input and some concrete steps that you can begin to apply today to help with your own grief journey. So how this podcast came about, this particular episode, I do a pro bono session a couple of times a year for the local hospital here in Ottawa, the children's hospital, for the palliative care team. And I'm asked a couple of times a year to go and speak to the parents who are in the bereavement group. And each time I share some kind of tools related to mindfulness that help people overcome grief. But in this particular group that I did this past week, I decided to use my own story. And I was exhausted by the end of this meeting. I've realized how draining it can be to talk about heavy feelings and to going back to memories that bring so much emotion. And so that made me think of everybody else who might be experiencing grief in silence, who might be thinking that this is something for you to overcome all by yourself. And the less you talk about it, the easier it gets. And so having having been able to share my story one more time yesterday to a group of parents made me realize the power that there is in that discharge of energy within the proper mechanisms and the proper boundaries of course but it inspired me to share my story so I hope you find some inspiration in here to go home to your own heart and do some of this uh, grief work because it's so important so I come to you on this particular podcast not as an expert in the field of grief but rather as a human who like you has suffered loss As I said, I'm going to open up by telling you a tiny bit about myself. My journey to motherhood hasn't been easy and was not easy. It was full of effort, fear, expenses, even therapy, and reoccurring losses. Two years into my trying to conceive journey, my husband and I decided to look for fertility help because it wasn't wasn't happening. By the time everything lined up for us, four years had gone by, where every single month we mourn the loss of our fertility. So for those of you who have on top of experiencing losses, or maybe you haven't experienced a loss, but you have experienced a long journey to conceive, you probably understand the grief that I'm talking about. Each month, that time of the month when you're really hoping you don't get your period this time, and you do get it, there is a moment of grief and you're mourning what that could have been, what that little egg could have meant. Each period in my heart felt like the loss of a baby. I didn't know it then, but every month I experienced grief for four consecutive years. Now, this is heavy. It's a heavy emotion to have for this long period of time. But of course, at the the time, I would just think I was being hormonal, and that's why I was being so sensitive. Now, in retrospect, I've realized that I was grieving all along. After I felt IUI, for those of you who have no idea what IUI is, is one form of helping couples conceive with medical help, but it's less intrusive than an in vitro treatment. Uh, so we tried one of those to begin with, and it didn't work, and it was devastating. So we decided to finally invest into our first in vitro treatment. That meant weekly checkups, tons of medical interventions, especially for me. And uh, in and out of the fertility clinic, 
ultrasounds, prepping everything for this big day. And the big day came where the lab called us and told us that our first IVF had successfully created four beautiful embryos in the lab. So that means that was my egg, my husband's sperm, and we had four little guys just growing in the lab. We were thrilled because this actually meant four possibilities of becoming a parent. This happiness didn't last too long. Two days later, we heard back and all the embryos, except for one, had passed or they didn't make it to the developmental stage for proper transfer. So this meant we only had one embryo and they wanted to make the transfer as soon as possible. So we went back to the clinic, we prepared for it, and we were so excited. As sad as it was to lose three, we had hope in the one we had. Now we went into the clinic, we got our transfer. I remember specifically the doctor meeting with us prior to the transfer and saying this embryo looks beautiful, it has the division of cells that you want to see happening. And off we went. They transferred this embryo into my warm uh, uterus and we got to wait. It was about six weeks later that I realized this little baby hadn't taken either. So this was our very first big experience of loss specifically for me because as the woman you get to experience what it's like in your physical body to let go of an embryo. Embryo called by the doctors but if this had had occurred naturally this would have been we would have been calling uh, the embryo a baby. Needless to say after such a long road to get there after so much so many appointments we were devastated. And I learned two things about grief in that particular moment. One, that regardless of the size of the being that you love, grief is the same size. It's equally immense. My little baby was microscopic in size, yet this loss was huge in my grieving heart. And the other thing I learned about grief in that particular moment is that humans were like elephants. And... The four years before that, when each time I was getting my period and I felt the loss of a potential baby, all of that came for, forward full force the moment I knew this baby was also gone. So whenever we experience a new sense of grief, all the other previous griefs we've ever had in our life kind of come back. So it feels pretty immense. <sighs> Following our journey and honoring our big desire to become parents, we went through three more rounds of IVS. I will spare you the details, but I can tell you in, in, in three words what those experiences were like, loss after loss. At some point in my journey, I made the commitment to hold on to hope. So that I could keep having the courage to try one more time. I am happy to say that six months ago, a week before Thanksgiving, my miracle baby came, in, came into this world to teach me that betting to hope and unconditional love is absolutely worth it. So I have prepared for you a talk to walk you through some of my learned lessons. And I'm going to ask you to please listen to these as ideas, as invitations, and take what feels right for you and forget about the rest. I will say that the IVF cycle that brought my little miracle was the one that initially proved to be the least successful. We didn't have four embryos, we didn't have two, we only had one. The doctor had asked me if I wanted to cancel the cycle. And I remember saying, nope, this could be my heart of gold. And my heart of gold, he was. So yes, I am a professional social worker. I am a clinician. I provide people with emotional support based on research 
and theories that we know help people feel better mentally and emotionally. But I want you to forget about that for a moment. As I walk you through the six steps, I walk you through them as a mom who have who has experienced loss, as a woman who has gone through infertility, and as a human who in this experience of pain and loss has turned into her own resources to get through the other side. So I would like to begin by walking you through what a pregnancy after loss is like. Because I think that for most of us anyways, if you've experienced the loss of a pregnancy, we immediately want to get back on it. It's, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a survivor, internal survivor, survivor mode that we have built in that we know we ought to do this again. And we have the courage that comes from love and we say, let's do this again. So in my experience, that pregnancy after loss is incredibly exciting. It is so exciting to find out that we are pregnant again. However, almost immediately with that excitement comes significant fear and anxiety because we remember our previous loss or losses. So almost immediately, grief walks its way into our excitement and we feel both so excited and so terrified. And this is when I realized it was absolutely crucial to change fear for courage and disbelief for hope. And I began my own work. I was basically applying to myself all the wonderful tips and tools that I give to my clients. And you know what? I can say to it, it works. So first and foremost, tip number one that I want to give you, honor all of your emotions. I know perhaps if you are anything like me or like most people I work with, you might feel allergic to uncomfortable emotions. And you know the ones I'm talking about. Fear, sadness, feeling vulnerable, grief. And under that allergy, we result to ignoring those those emotions, avoiding them, and not feeling them fully. And this has been a belief of mine since I was a, a young child. It's better to feel pain intensively and let it go through you that, and, and let it come to an end, then feel less of an intense pain throughout the rest of your life because we don't want to feel it. And this is exactly what happens in our emotional world if we don't allow the emotions to exist because we have deemed them uncomfortable and unwanted. These emotions don't have room and space, and so they will continue to call out for your attention until you let them be. So, what I've done for this to honor my emotions. I got very close to a mindfulness practice or meditation practice of meditating to mantras. Mantras are phrases or words that we can use to change the internal energy of our mind and our body. So just as when we're anxious, we repeat the same words and images into our mind and they give us an emotion and a behavior physiologically, the same happens to Uh, our mind when we direct it to a positive, loving energy of words that come from a mantra. The one that helped me the most throughout my losses was, you have to feel it to heal it. You have to feel it to heal it. In other words, if you want that grief to be healed, you want to feel it. If you want that sadness, that anxiety, whatever the emotion, it's unwanted. You really want that to be healed. You must at the time to heal it. The other one that helped me hugely was the only way out is through. Now, the only way out is through reminded me that I really needed to go through this. Whether I want it or not, it was happening. And if I wanted to get through it, I must have had the courage to see it go through me. After working for 14 years as a clinician, I can tell you that I have proven that no emotions will kill you. You can have all these emotions and still be you. So as much as we say, oh, this isn't like me, as long as you're human, you are capable (laughs) to having all emotions and you can still go back to 
the calm person that you regularly are, but being sad is also a part of you. So feeling and honoring all emotions and doing this mantra work is very important. Perhaps you're asking yourself, okay, so how does the mantra work works? So there's two ways of using mantras. You could set a time to sit down and meditate. You time yourself and you say, okay, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be repeating this mantra. Or you could grab this mantra, whichever spoke most to you, put in a sticky note, sticky note in your office, if that's where you're spending most of your day or at home or on your phone. And anytime this, you remember to use it, you repeat it. You repeat it sort of like a prayer. That's how mantras work. Tip number two, anxiety is inevitable. I am telling you, having a pregnancy loss, no matter how early, is traumatic. And we now know something we didn't know before. Crap, we can lose a baby. That happens. We just never think it can happen to us until it does. So that anxiety, it's created because we think we can prepare ourselves for a future loss. So some of my clients will say, and, and honestly, I, I think I may have done this for, for some time, but maybe I didn't say there too long. Some of my clients will say, Olga, well, if I don't attach to this new baby too much, maybe I'm better prepared for the eventuality of losing this baby. And I tell them the same thing. Listen, when a loss comes, there is nothing that you can do before to make that hurt less. It's going to hurt. If you lose somebody you love, that's going to hurt hugely, regardless of how much you're worried about it before. So there is no such a thing as banking grief prior to so that when it comes time to you have a reserve of already grief that you can use. That doesn't work. That's a mental trap. So whenever you feel that this is the best way to, he to heal, just know that that's a trap of your mind and it's not true. Now, my greatest tip for this type of anxiety as you're going through a second pregnancy is whenever your mind jumps to what if, you know, those scenarios where you're just visualizing that potentially loss or what if something's wrong with the baby, what if I die, what if I divorce, what if, what if, what if, come back to what is. What is actually happening? Because that brings you back to the present. So it brings the crazy mind that's projecting onto a scary future back into what's actually happening. And it brings you back to reality. Right at this moment, what is, is that I have a healthy baby in my belly. Right at this moment, what is, is that I am healthy all is well. Right? So it brings you back to a sense of safety. And it reminds the mind that that what if is non-existent. So it's a waste of energy and it brings you back to the present. So perhaps you want to write this down somewhere. Changing the what ifs for what is. It was huge, huge, huge in my process. And you know what? I use this not just for, uh, I, not just, I didn't just use it for the length of my pregnancy. I use it all the time because <laughs> all the time my mind is jumping onto what if. Tip number three. Perhaps you already started doing this. Perhaps you haven't. Do not compare. Do not compare your story to somebody else's. Do not compare your grief to somebody else's. Because guess what? You will always lose in that comparison. An interesting fact about our brain is that when we go to compare, our brain has already pre-selected somebody who you think is better off than you. So in that comparison, you are always going to lose. When you try to say, well, my grief is not as bad as theirs, they have it worse. Or they know nothing about this because my grief is worse. Or why is it, uh, look at them, they had their baby, I didn't. Like none of these comparisons will ever make you feel, God, I'm so glad I walked myself through that comparison. I'm feeling like a million bucks. This was amazing energy and medicine for my soul. The opposite is true. It's draining. It brings you out of who you are, your story to want to fit in somebody else's story. And guess what? If you try somebody else's shoes that have been worn for a while, they're not going to fit comfy on your feet. They're just not your shoes. So it's useless, useless, useless to compare. I promise you that if you do compare, you're going to come up to a place of despair. And if that's how you want to feel, then go ahead and compare away. Otherwise, tell yourself, set the commitment to yourself with your partner. Hey, whenever we're feeling like we're comparing... 
Let's call each other out and let's not compare. Please, please, please come back to your story. Honor your story is unique. Like somebody else's story is their story, not yours. So the lack of comparison not only helps us to come back to our story and honor it, but also it helps you not take on somebody else's story as if it was your own. All right, tip number four. Okay, this is a good one. Guys, if you're just going to remember one of the things I, I will say today, please let it be this point. Perhaps you already are doing it, perhaps you're not. But here it is. Do not ask why. Ah, if, if you are anything like me, you probably have asked, why me? Why now? Why has this have to happen? Like, what is it that life is trying to teach me? So I just want you to think back of the life to become a mom. I was going to be a horrible mom, and this is why I wasn't becoming a mom. She said I must have been paying a karma from a past life because obviously in this life I was good, but maybe in the last one I wasn't, and that's why I was being punished. And I was not uh, and that's why I wasn't being a mom. She even said my husband was going to leave me because who would want to be married to somebody who can't have babies? Guys, she said all these things. When I ask why, those were the kind of answers that were coming up and that she was giving me. That horrible human who was talking to me that way was myself. I'm not proud I wasn't also conscious, but I tell you, once I brought my awareness to the way in which I was talking to myself, to the kind of words that were coming out of my mind when I was asking why, there was no hesitation on my mind. That question was not helpful. So I encourage you to do what I did and to do what I coach my clients to do. Whenever you're asking why, change that question to <clears throat> now what? Now what? This has happened. We can't change it. We've experienced this life event that we don't like, but it's happened. Now what? Because that question, now what, brings your brain to a place of resourcefulness. It starts looking for possibilities instead of limitations. So ask yourself, now that I'm here, what am I doing about it? And let your beautiful brain guide you. Let your heart show you the way because it will. That's my greatest advice to you from out all six of these points. Switch the question. It's amazing what can happen to our brain when we just ask a different question. Lastly, I have two more tips for you. Number five is being one that has been incredibly valuable to me, which is turning fear into courage and hope. So you guys, I don't know where you feel fear. I usually feel fear in the pit of my stomach. Like even before having this conversation with you guys sitting here, reminds me of my own pain and that gives me a bit of fear and whenever I feel that pain in my belly I say hey you know what when I'm excited about something I feel the same thing so I'm gonna let the power of this fear power me through and I'm going to turn it into courage courage to tell you my story courage to choose differently depending on what you're going through so there is that power of decision to say, thank you, fear, for showing up. You've given me immense amount of power because that's how fear is powerful. And I'm going to use this power to convert it into courage so that I can make my next step, so that I can choose to think differently, so that I can ask now what and not why, so that I can honor all of my emotions, especially those who I hate feeling. So that I can bring my brain back into what is instead of what is. So that I do not compare. That's the courage you can switch your fear from to into. And last but not least, guys, I'll rewrite your story. That's tip number six. Do you know when you're telling your story, what lenses are you using? Are you feeling victimized by your story? Are you feeling like there is no way out? And if, if so, that's okay. That might be a stage. But I want you to begin to think, later in life, how do I want to tell this story? How do I want to feel after this event has really, truly gone through my life? Do I want to feel like this part of my life made me stronger, better human, 
taught me a whole lot, then I have to begin to write that story. Do I want to feel defeated? And this is the reason why from now on I will be forever hopeless. Just pay attention to what story you're writing. And if the story you have in your mind does not help you, rewrite it. You are the architect of your life. So you're capable and able to rewrite those stories to make them be helpful for you. Do it from a place of love and not fear. So guys, I hope you found this helpful. This was me talking from the heart. Six tips that I use to overcome my own grief that I still use. And I'd like to leave you with two reminders. First one is grief never ends, and that's okay. And I want to tell a little story. When my baby boy was born, you want to know what my thought, my first thought was. Actually, when my baby boy was born, he it was a long labor, three days of laboring actively, till we finally realized he was stuck in the birth canal, and they decided to take me into a C-section. And I felt that I took the baby out. The doctor said the baby's out, and I did not hear my baby cry. So I had time, this might have been seconds. In my mind, it felt forever. I had time to ask twice, why is he not crying? Why is he not crying? And then he let go the loudest of cries. Also, to this day, the best sound I have ever heard in my life. I still get emotional thinking about it. And they brought the baby on to me. And my first thought was, holy crap, we made a white baby. Because for those of you who have never seen me, I'm South American. I'm definitely on the brown side of skin tones. My husband is pretty white. Uh, We had this thing going on. Will he look like me? Will he look like him? So that was the first thing I said. But I tell you what, the second thought into my head was, wow, so this is what all my other babies would have looked like. Because you see, I never had the chance to meet them, to put a face to that little embryo. So... I learned at that particular moment that grief never ends, that you can have a moment of such an intense joy and happiness and disbelief, and at the same time, you can be brought back within a second to the losses you've had, and that's okay. So I think most of us have the expectation that grief has an end date, and that expectation will bring a lot of suffering and disappointment to oneself. So I understand that I'm going to forever keep my little children that didn't make it into this world physically in my heart, and that's okay, that they still make me relate to other humans in a way that I never thought I would from this place of grief and loss. So grief never ends, and that's okay. And the second reminder I want to give you is that fear after a traumatic event or after a loss is inevitable, but our response to it is our choice. So I want to leave you with that reflective question. What are you choosing? What are you, as of right now, choosing to respond to fear when it shows up? When it shows up. So you guys make a commitment after you hear this podcast. Set an intention. Because I tell you what, that is going to make all the difference for your healing process. I personally decided that whenever fear was going to show up, I was going to invite fear to come with me. And I promise you, my last pregnancy, I had fear every single day for nine months, for 39 weeks exactly. And the fear ended the moment I heard that baby cry. And then a whole new set of fears came in. So I welcome fear into my life to be like my companion. That's been my attitude. I don't refuse it. I don't pretend it's not there. And I most definitely don't believe what fear tells me. So <clears throat> those are the only the last two reminders I wanted to leave you with. Fear is inevitable, but our, our response to it is entirely our choice. Which one is it going to be? Grief never ends. And then I left you with all these six tips that were incredibly helpful to me. Also the tips that I walk all my clients through. And I see them so beautifully transforming this fear, this anger, this frustration into unconditional love guys i hope this was helpful if you hear this and think of someone who might be benefiting from it please please share also write down comments let me know if this was helpful if you want to hear more from this subject and if so what would you like me to talk about 
follow me on social media at Instagram Olga's Way that studio or in Facebook at Olga's Way where I put weekly content for free videos podcasts and meditations and I hope to connect with you in some point in some way from my heart to yours namaste <laughs>